Anyway, today we've got Cecilia Abade back from yesterday. To, she's going to just show a couple of Google apps that, that take Google to the, Google Glass apps take Google to the next dimension. And first, we, we're going to hear from um, Jaris, J.C. Miller. I'm going to let her tell you who she is, but uh, Jaris has some amazing insights into where Google Glass is going, and it's, it's a thrill for me to have her here. And she's going to spend really the bulk of the uh, of the time we have left doing her presentation, and Cecilia's just going to quickly show us the apps. And then we're going to wrap at 5.15, and we're going to do our Vuzix giveaway. So, Jaris, it's all yours. Great. <clears throat> hello. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to take um, uh, this conversation to an entirely different level um, by, for whatever set of reasons, both uh, Cecilia and myself have uh, found ourselves dead center at uh, controversy, the, the glass controversy. Um, first of all, because in Seattle, uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, David Minert, uh, banned Google Glass from his establishments, from uh, the Five Point Cafe, and also from Lost Lake. And uh, as we know, uh, uh, Cecilia also uh, received a traffic ticket. Um, both is, of these stories went viral. Um, and uh, they were picked up not only by our, our national press, the New York Times, but they also um, were picked up by the BBC and The Guardian. So this, is, this is emerged as an international topic, not just a, uh, a local topic. So what that did for us in Seattle is it forced the conversation deeper and farther into the future than maybe is happening in some of the other technology centers. So before I begin, let me ask you, what is the most successful industry in Seattle, coming out of Seattle? Does anybody have an, an opinion of what that is? What? Software. Okay, here I hear software. What else? Coffee. What else? Boeing. Anybody else? Sportswear. Sportswear. Anybody else over there? OK. Actually, it's none of those. None of those industries is the most successful industry in Seattle. Seattle is the philanthropic capital of the universe. We actually have amassed the largest largesse of philanthropic giving in the history of humanity, and it flows through Seattle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the nonprofit in industry and um, how Seattle is going to emerge as the heartbeat of the 21st century as we move into wearable technologies, as we move into the age of context, and as we move forward into the Internet of Things. So I want to give you a little bit of context of, uh, of glass and, and what that means. Um, first of all, a collective shift in point of view. Our first large collective shift in point of view was when uh, we moved, we actually flew um, from the Earth to the moon. We shifted our point of view. We looked back at the Earth, and we were able to see the connections between all of the land masses. And we were able to see the Earth against the cosmos. So this was a huge aha moment uh, that happened in the 60s that really changed our point of view and our perspective. Um, these are the researchers. This is uh, Lynn Margulis and her first husband. Um, Carl Sagan and her partner, who helped uh, James Lovelock, who helped develop the first um, interdependent models between the Earth and the biosphere and between the Earth and the cosmos. Um, and in uh, this really moved us in a totally different direction, and it moved us farther into space in thinking in terms of holistic and dynamic systems. 
Um, I had the great good fortune of uh, working with Lynn Margulis on two of her textbooks, and she was really the person who influenced me in thinking from the micro to the macro and back again. In 2008, um, two of the world's great humanitarians came to uh, Seattle. Uh, this is uh, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, and they challenged us in Seattle to move past all of our headiness and shift our point of view once again from our heads into our hearts. Uh, and this is, was a particularly um, important conversation because again, we have hundreds of billions of dollars flowing through Seattle and our nonprofit community to the edges of the earth. So that is very much ingrained in, into our cultural DNA. Um, we, I'm happy to have two other of the Glass Squad members with us. Uh, five of us were selected to uh, uh, actually move, go down to South Florida, and we were asked to create the first glass films and the first uh, glass adventure films for remote travel and uh, remote location filming uh, used through glass. And it was those foundations from that shifting of point of view that really informed our work with the Find Your Island Challenge. Um, here is uh, my dear friend Eva. She uh, shot the first uh, glass parasailing film, Hands Free. And Hillary Topper has uh, also gone on to uh, create an amazing uh, first generation uh, Glasslandia um, uh, reality vlog series that has been wildly popular. So these were some of the uh, 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 some of the uh, experiences we had with the Find Your Island Challenge. Um, Hillary actually just recently uh, interviewed uh, Tamara Piggott, uh, who sponsored our particular Find Your Island Challenge. And we, uh, our particular program uh, garnered 70 million hits for Lee County. And uh, Hillary's Glasslandia series also uh, uh, has garnered about 50 million hits. We were picked up uh, and featured in Mashable uh, and also on ABC and NBC. So this was the first marketing PR program that was wildly successful as well as disrupting the adventure travel and the travel industry. So this is what we have accomplished so far. But the silver lining, the, the transcendent function of the Find Your Island Challenge is that we actually open the door for remote glass education and re remote glass medicine. So we're talking about technology at the margins. And again, I, I uh, need to reiterate that most of our philanthropic dollars flowing from Seattle are at the margins. They are in third world locations. This is where that money is flowing to. And uh, this is Joan Halifax. She's a National Geographic explorer. She takes medical teams up to the high Himalayas every single year and uh, actually serves the nomadic populations in, in those regions. She does take iPad technology with her, but imagine if we actually paired her with glass technology, with a loon, uh, with a loon connectivity, and uh, Google Plus Hangouts broadcast capability, how much she further she could serve her populations. So these are the kinds of conversations that are emerging in Seattle and in the Seattle space. Uh, this is Sergey Brin, and this is the, uh, the glass team uh, uh, that actually created glass and glasses augmented reality capability. Uh, as we know, as we've heard from uh, many other folks, glass has sensor capability, and we're looking at using that sensor capability and its existing uh, augmented reality capability to provide biometric feedback, uh, developing uh, programs that could uh, be uh, created to, um, created for empathy or for uh, happiness or for focus for optimal performance. 
Uh, these are two uh, researchers at the University of Washington that have recently demonstrated the first successful mind-machine connection. Now, what's interesting about them is that they found, in order for their, uh, for their program to be successful, their, their, um, their research to be successful, that they needed to have an empathic communication between the two of them. So going back to the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, they asked us to shift our point of view from our heads to our heart, and they asked us, can we teach emotional intelligence? And it is this, this core question that we are discovering as we move forward in our Seattle Glass community. So this is uh, Matthew Ricard. He holds a PhD in molecular genetics from Louis Pasteur Institute. Uh, he did not begin his mind training. He actually left science behind. And he did not begin his mind training until uh, uh, Way late in his career, he was in his 20s, which is well past the age for neuroplasticity. Uh, he is the happiest man on the planet, and uh, uh, basically, he is about two standard deviations off the bell curve and has completely reconfigured his left frontal gyrus. Um, one of the questions that we have been asking is, again, he is not Asian. He started his mind training uh, relatively late. I want to make this core point. This is not about religion, nor is it about spirituality. The, uh, although those are wonderful things, this is about a technique. Mm -hmm. and, this is, and what we are asking is, can we actually use Glass's existing capability to accelerate and emulate Mathieu Ricard's technique for happiness. Um, as I mentioned, he reconfigured his left foot frontal gyrus. That is the seat of positive emotions, and he is literally the happiest person on the planet. He's also written a book called Happiness. So th these, are, these are one of the questions that we're taking a look at. Um, this is Russell Wilson. He is an advanced meditator. He is also the quarterback for the Seahawks. So again, uh, we are taking a look at a Glass's inherent capability for building an application for optimal performance. Uh, these, these, are some of the, these are some of the questions that we're talking about within the Glass community in Seattle. Um, as we know, the San Francisco 49ers already have uh, their beta testing a, a, a glass experience for their fans, for a VIP experience. We want to level that up. We want to take that up and actually create an optimal uh, performance program to actually train uh, um, the athletes as well as provide a VIP experience for the Seattle Seahawks fans. One of the questions that we've been asking ourselves uh, as we um, dive, as we've done this deep dive into glass culture in Seattle is, are these glass for good programs? Could they possibly be a precursor toward an evolutionary leap? So these are four intelligences, four white guys, which that is not lost on me. But if we actually assisted them in shifting their perspective from their head into their heart, and they were, they were able to open themselves enough to trust each other and engage with each other, and we gave them a higher purpose, a transcendent function, it is our thinking that, that this collective intelligence would kickstart humanity into a whole nother evolutionary leap. Now, a lot of folks might think that that is uh, really far off base, but might I point out that Microsoft, Facebook, and Google have partnered against the NSA. So that may not, as, and that may not be as far-fetched as one might think that uh, for a higher purpose, this collective intelligence could bring us forward in, into a totally new direction. So this, what 
the core values of Seattle are, it's a tight community. One of the, and as I've mentioned, um, our artistic community supports our technology uh, community, which, which supports our philanthropic community. Uh, and our core values in Seattle are honesty, integrity, authenticity, vulnerability, um, transparency, and giving back. That is what we do best. Uh, and our, the, 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 the people who are really leading the way and showing us how to the, do this and is, has always shown us how to do this is the Seattle arts and music scene. Uh, Macklemore, extremely vulnerable, very accessible, honest uh, um, uh, artist, um, as have been prior generations before him. Uh, we are in the process in Seattle of jumpstarting yet another uh, music revolution. Uh, Macklemore, the, the, the whole uh, music uh, industry in Seattle has been revitalized again, and we are uh, creating yet another round of arts and music environment in Seattle uh, through his tremendous success. And might I also add, it's that DIY ethos. He has also completely redefined the, inner, uh, the business model in the entertainment industry. He did this himself. And that is uh, an, an ethos that's very strong in Seattle. So as um, Paul Allen, Elon Musk, Richard Branson kick us off uh, into another age of space exploration. We believe that it is artists like Macklemore uh, with his emphasis on uh, vulnerability, authenticity, um, the, the, uh, will, the, uh, will actually act as rocket fuel as we move forward into another age of exploration where one industry will actually inform another industry. And one of the questions that we've been thinking about is, could all of this uh, be actually a precursor to another evolutionary leap? In, we've just discovered the Higgs boson particle um, I was, um, I've been very grateful that I actually helped film at the Large Hadron Collider, um, uh, their, their first hangout on air at the Large ha uh, Hadron Collider, and these, what we're seeing from the description of Higgs boson reality is very different from the reality that you and I live in today. Um, so, you know, could all of this technology, all of this space exploration be actually leading us up to the ability to inhabit the reality that's being described by the Higgs boson? So, in Seattle, we feel that we have it all. We have had, we have the soul, we've got the smarts, we've got the sight, and we've got the soundtrack, and we really feel that we're going to be at the at the very heart of this 21st century reality. Um, and I just want to thank everybody in Seattle, and especially the, uh, the Seattle Glass Explorers team, which has been absolutely amazing, and also the Paul G. Allen um, Center uh, and uh, the other people who have, who have really stepped forward and supported our community. And uh, thank you very much. Well, it was different. <laughs> no, I have access. Uh, one second here. Is the mic working? Yeah. So one second here to set up really quick, hopefully. Something really happy, fun, uh, funny happened. And I don't know, can I tell them the story about your CEO? And <laughs> so Tony was just telling me that his CEO really wanted him to bring the girl that got the glass tickle, glass ticket, bring her here into the conference, and he didn't know how to reach or something. And he ended up finding out right now that I was that person that got the Google glass ticket. So it's um, a little bit infamous situation where I'm famous, but. Maybe not for the right reasons, we're not sure. Um, not connecting here, what's going on? Press play. Play? <laughs>
Uh, there it is. No, it was just a connection issue. But I think it's working now. Uh, we got a mirror though. Hold on. One more second. No. I think I need some assistance. <laughs> so, anyways, to start. Um, what I wanted to tell you is mostly that we, uh, the glass explorers, including like Jerry's and me and many of you there, I know you were the glass person, the, the TV show kind of thing. That's very awesome. Uh, we've been embarked in an adventure since uh, some of us May, June, sometime last year. And uh, it really is an experiment. We are like guinea pigs out there wearing this new thing in our faces. And uh, you really get to experiment uh, you know, meeting with people in the streets, uh, everybody is curious about it, or a lot of people are gonna ask you about it. If you're in a hurry, that's the time to take your glass off because people will stop you in the street because they wanna know if that's Google Glass and if they can try it and all that. So it's a very interesting adventure. My adventure particularly, besides as a user and as a person that goes out in the street, which is already a lot, <laughs> believe me, as a Google Glass Explorer, it's also as a developer. So as a developer in February, I was lucky to be selected by Google uh, to be in a hackathon, the first hackathon where they presented how do you program for this, how do you develop. Is it working? No? Yeah, how do you if not, full screen, uh, here, oops, wrong key, but here. Yeah. So, as a developer, um, I got to know the first way that Google planned to let people uh, develop applications, and that was what I, I was telling you about the, being a guinea pig. Uh, in all those levels, as a user, as a developer. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the philosophy. So every time we are developing applications for Google Glass, or even you as users, when you want applications for Google Glass, what is the philosophy behind it? What's different? Because obviously, a lot of the things you're going to be seeing here can be done with a cell phone. So a lot of people are like, okay, but what's new and different when you're using Google Glass? In a lot of it is, in a nutshell, the philosophy of the device. So this is a wearable device that is thinking on the opposite of what you're seeing there. It's thinking of getting us out of doing this and getting us out in the world. It's a more immersive experience. And it's also a natural uh, interface kind of experience. So imagine uh, voice. Voice is something very native to us. And listening to something is very native. It's, those are natural interfaces that we already can build with. Not a keyboard. A keyboard is something we learned uh, older by. But we know we've been doing for millions of years, we've been doing voice and hearing and listening. So this is a big part of it. Another part of it is context. So because I'm wearing this device, it can know things about me. For instance, where I am. So if I'm in this conference, in the future, software will offer me utilities that have to do with conference. Maybe I will have the list of everybody that is here available so I can identify people when I see them and I know what to talk about. Uh, if I can remember even if I met them before. So all those things, context is very, very relevant. I really believe that Google played it very safe and they didn't go all the way to augmented reality. They played it more like augmented context or context augmentation, whatever we want to call it. And it's more about giving me what I need right now, but being out of the way when I don't need it. And this is very core to the philosophy of any software that we develop on this device. So the first way that Google provided to develop for Google Glass, it's all about the cloud. So you see there in the diagram pretty much Glass connects to Google Glass Cloud, and the cloud connects to your software cloud, and then it comes back through Google's cloud and back to the device. That was a very simple interface that they designed originally for developers, and uh, it really didn't have all the capabilities. You couldn't tap into every, into every capability that Glass have. So the first things we created are very, very simple. One of them, for instance, we created particularly is Genie, and Genie is like your virtual assistant on Glass, and what it does is allow you to build lists of things. So let's say you meet with someone here and you want to remember their name. So you go to Ginny and say, hey, Ginny, remember this new name that I just got. I want to check them out on Google+. Plus. Or uh, someone mentions a new software, a new device, or a new book that I should be reading, or a movie that I should watch, all those things, or something I want to buy. So it might be something as simple as 
um, okay, Genie, buy bananas. It could be anything that I need to remember, and then I will be able to recall it when I need it by geolocation or by the time or by any association of hashtags. That was one of the first things we did with the Mirror API, and this was part of 33 Labs. That was my first um, startup uh, as I started to dedicate all my free time to glass. One of the other things we experimented with is uh, in museums, for instance, to try to augment a piece of art. So if I'm in the museum, I take a picture of a particular piece of art, it will come back and tell me, oh, this is this and this uh, painter, and it was done in this epoch, and these are the other things that were happening at that time, and these are the other paintings by this author. And what's very, very interesting is that um, we can, uh, in glass, we can show a little bit only, but we can hear a lot more. So what's happening a lot with applications is that they, let's say news, if you get CNN, you could get a snapshot, you would get a picture of what the news is, but you can listen for la much longer. And that's a very interesting thing, the whole thing with voice. Actually, I will tell you about uh, how I was one day in a meeting room, and we were having a casual conversation in a meeting um, about how many sales we had in a particular area. And it was like, boom, for me, I thought, I should be able to ask Glass, and it should hook up to my database and answer this question, all with voice. And that's when I started to realize, that was after a few months of wearing glass, I started to realize that voice is the new touch. And I blogged about it. Uh, and in the way I say it, when I say voice is the new touch, some people think, oh, come on, voice is not going to replace touch. Of course it won't. I'm not saying it will replace touch. But what I'm saying is any device, any software, any hardware that we have in the future, besides having touch, it will have to have a new added layer of voice. So think about this, it's, voice is critical for the future, not only because of glass, but as users become used to this kind of technology and you can talk to it, it becomes second nature too fast. In the same way that doing this to turn glass on becomes second nature to the point that sometimes you don't have glass and you're doing this. <laughs> Didn't it happen yeah. to you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Someone is laughing here because you know, or doing this and you don't even have glass. So these things, because they're memory muscle or they're things that are very instinctual and they're already built in on us, they become very predominant. So for anybody that is building software or hardware in the future, I really would like you to consider voice. Voice is going to be very, very important, especially uh, not only glass. People are going to be using Moto, Moto X, the, mo the new cell phones. We are talking, even Siri is a good attempt at voice, but I think it's getting to the level where with Motorola new cell phones, it has a core that is just, it has like eight cores, the thing, right? Uh, the Moto X, but particularly it has one core that is just there to listen to your voice. So that shows us something. Okay, back to Google development. After they, they launched the Mirror API, people were like, oh no, I'm gonna hack this thing. This thing has Android inside, and I'm gonna just hack it and do fun stuff with it. So uh, that's when they decided to launch what they call the GDK, which is a development kit that allows you to get to everything that is on glass, all the camera, the sensors, everything. And I did show yesterday a little bit of our workout exercise thing. Uh, LinksFit, which is an, a new, better way of working out using the sensors and using immersive technology and counting with you, talking to you, and listening to your voice. So uh, I'm gonna skip this a little bit and go back to a demo, which is what I like to really do here. And I'm gonna show you a few things. How many of you didn't see um, Link's Fit yesterday? A few of you didn't see it, very few? Okay, I'll show you later. <laughs> it will be boring for the rest, sorry. So, Let's uh, show a few things here. So this is Glass. Um, we're going to say, okay, Glass. Oh, let me show you something first, hold on. <laughs> I have a sign here. This is a sign that is in German. And this is software that is not by us anymore. So for, just to clarify, uh, my startup is called Vitan Atom now, and we've done Genie, we've done LinksFit, and I'm happy to show you more about it. But now I'm going to show you things that come from the glass community at a larger scale. And uh, I have a sign here that is, uh, says uh, something in German that I can't pronounce because I'm going to mess it up. And uh, I don't know what it really means, although I learned the hard way in, in traveling in, in Germany what the first word is. <laughs> 
Uh, and I'm going to have an application here that's going to help me interpret what it says live. So, okay, Glass, translate this. So it's launching an application. It's already set up for German to English. I'm going to focus the text. And hold on, I'm not doing a very good job in holding it, hold on. Right there, maybe. Exit, keep free. Did you everybody see it? Yeah? So it's doing translation right away. It's working offline, which is very interesting that they could do that. And that's just showing, of course, we're not all the time seeing signs here and there, but it just shows you the potential on the kind of world we can live in the future where we can have simultaneous translation as we walk in the street, as we listen to someone, etc. Let me show you a game, something different. Okay, Glass, play a game. So Espelista is another a game by a Glue company. It's the name of the company. And it's going to throw a few letters out there. And we have to put them together to form a, a, a word. Anybody got the word? Yeah? That's a simple one. So I'm going to move my head to, to turn into one of the bubbles. And the bubble go into its place. Because with my head, if I select good enough, it should select the E. OK. Come on, I'm keeping it pretty stable. OK, that's in one day. I'll go just with it. But you get the idea. Somehow the E doesn't seem to work. I, I said I didn't develop this, right? <laughs> I was just kidding. <laughs> it's a very fun game. I played it many times, and uh, it usually works. I don't know why the E is stuck there. But you get the idea. So I'm moving my head. I'm interacting with the virtual world. I'm doing stuff. Imagine starting to combine all these technologies. I'm almost there. Uh, Combine all these technologies. So now you're getting the Plantronics thing that many of you saw that have accelerometer and other things, and you combine it with these, and then uh, we get the shirt that was having other sensors, and we combine. So we start to connect, and not only with our own body, but also with the world around us. Uh, like uh, many of you probably know about Tesla cars. Someone developed an app for Tesla, so from your glass, you can control your car, you can control, know when it's charged, you can know when, or you can turn the temperature in, things like that. So this is a perfect device to control anything that is happening outside, anything that is in your environment, and because we're gonna have so many more things that are gonna be controllable around us, it becomes like a hub for using very simply all those things. I think I'm running out of time. You are so out Tony of time. Is, yes, you are. <laughs> I am already out of time. Yes, it's easier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, I have 100 questions, but we're just not going to be able to, to get to them. I, I, I tried to keep this thing on schedule, but unfortunately, today, we, we went 15 minutes over. That's OK. So I have to cut off the questions, because we do need to do the Vuzix um, M100 giveaway, which is coming up next. But, um, you know, uh, uh, catch these folks as soon as they come off the stage. It's, it's perfectly good. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.